JBS presents the Hampton Synagogue's Author Discussion Series with Rabbi Avraham Bronstein. Newly published Shonda, a memoir of shame and secrecy, the book Letty will be discussing tonight with Rabbi Bronstein, has been referred to, and I'm combining a number of quotes from a variety of sources, it's been referred to as intimate, complex, and beautiful storytelling, a stunning piece of life and art, devastatingly honest and soul-bearing a book that dismantles the machinery of shame with stories that are vivid, emotional, and unforgettable. Shonda confronts the darkness, shrinks it, and brings us out into the light. Folks, currently, there is a lot of darkness out there. And although we tend to be a hopeful tribe, we can always use some additional light. So please welcome Letty Cotton Progerman to the Hampton Center. After such a glowing introduction, uh, the tendency is to respond with humility. But uh, I take my cue from Golda Meir, who said, don't be humble, you're not that great. <laughs> so I was asked to just do a short reading before we begin our conversation. Uh, growing up in the 1940s and 50s, when girls wore skirts, I distinctly remember my mother telling me that I must always wear clean underwear because if I get hit by a bus, everyone will see my panties. The threat of a Shonda, humiliation in front of others, was never far from my mother's mind. Worst of all, of course, was a Shonda for the Goyim, being humiliated in front of Gentiles. I grew up in a family of secrets, too many things judged shameworthy, too many truths covered up, embellished, repackaged. As a child, I thought secrecy and hiddenness were quintessentially Jewish. Leah hid behind the veil so Jacob would think his bride was Rachel. Hidden conversos in Spain and Frank hang hiding in the, in the uh, annex and Hester Panim, God God's self, hidden. My parents hid behind masks rather than show their imperfections. Perfect American Jews were not supposed to have miserable marriages, secret divorces, estranged brothers, unacknowledged or even abandoned children, alcohol problems, gay kids, missing uncles, an aunt who claimed to be barren but actually had two abortions, or a cousin whose mental and physical issues might cast doubt on the marriageability of all of us other cousins. My relatives argued out loud about politics, but whispered about the C word. My mother's kitchen was kosher, but we out, ate out on Sunday nights. Southern Fried Chicken with Buttermilk Biscuits at Topsy's on Queens Boulevard, or Oysters or Lobster at Lundy's in Sheepshead Bay. My father, a lawyer, was also a bar mitzvah tutor, a Hebrew teacher, a Baal Kore, a person who reads the Torah with, with ease, with cancellations, and a Talmud scholar. He was president of the Jamaica Jewish Center and of, he was county commander in Queens of the Jewish War Veterans and president of virtually every Jewish organization you could think of out here in, out in Queens. But he secretly smoked and drove on Shabbat. <laughs> he would put out his cigarette five blocks away. We would park our car five blocks away, and he would walk to shul as if he had come from home. Shonda is my journey of discovery and truth-telling. It is a memoir of shame and secrecy. I think it will resonate for everyone. But most of all, I hope it would, will inspire you 
to lead a secret free life. Thank you. Thank you. So, thank you. First question is, what motivated you to write your memoir in this way? Facing 80. <laughs> It, it has a, a, a chilling effect on a person. Uh, I always was the youngest in the room until I suddenly became the eldest in the room, and I, I, got, I was young so long I got used to it. Mm -hmm. But suddenly, my mortality hit me, and uh, I really thought I have to make sense of my life. There's so many disparate influences that I could name and so many experiences that uh, I could highlight, but I couldn't kind of see the through line that made me who I am and how I am. And um, I started writing it, and it was a kind of sprawling memoir, kind of went all over the place. It didn't have a unifying theme. And, um, and then my granddaughter, who uh, was a, a, a student at Yale and took a biography class, uh, in which she was assigned to write a biography about a living person, and she chose me. She asked her professor, and he had never heard of me. Uh, he's a professor of military history and a biography of, of men, and a biographer of men. So my granddaughter taught him, you know, mm -hmm. a little bit about American feminism, and he approved that she could write this story about my life. Um, and then she said, Grandma, the only way I'm going to do this is if you give me permission to say whatever I find in my research. And you're not, you're not going to edit me. You're not going to censor me. Or I'm not going to do it. I'll, I'll choose, you know, Barbara Streisand or something. <laughs> <laughs> and I swore that I wouldn't touch it. Um, she went up to my archives at Smith College. She spent days and days interviewing everybody in my life. She found my Brandeis friends, my high school friends, all my Ms. colleagues. She interviewed people I didn't even know I knew. <laughs> and then she said, I want to come into your house and see where you keep old stuff. Well, I, I'm a saver, because uh, I lost my mother when I was 15, and that's how I've sort of figured out uh, that excuses my obsession with keeping things, because I lost a lot as a child. And so there is a place where I sort of stick things. And in that place, which is a very deep cabinet in my study, which is lined with, with wooden file cabinets to begin with, she attacked the whole room. And then she says, what's down there? And I said, um, well, it's stuff that didn't go into the scrapbooks. And um, I've, I'm married for 59 years almost, and I have 59 scrapbooks from every single year since I met my husband. Um, and she said, what's down in that shelf? And I, I, I looked underneath, and there, and pushed in the back of this commodious shelf, was a plastic bag that I had forgotten my sister gave to me just before she died. My sister was 14 years older than I. And she had become the repository of all the stuff that my, our mother saved. And I pulled that out, and I opened it. And it had letters in it from 80 and 85 years ago. And my granddaughter, Molly, wasn't interested in that. She wanted to, from when I was born. So she said, you take it. And I dumped all of those letters on my dining room table and started reading. And suddenly, I had an open door into my parents' marriage, all their arguments, the history of our family, my mother's deathbed note to my sister. Um, I had, as you probably are going to ask me about, I had a sister I didn't know existed because we were not a perfect family. And though my parents lied to me about everything because they wanted me to feel I was from perfection and I had nothing to hide. They hid everything. And there in the letters was information I could never have gleaned any other way. And so though I was two years into the writing, suddenly it became a different book. And the through line was clear. Uh, fear of the Shanda, of shame, and secrecy was the were the defining characteristics of my family. Wow. 
So what was it like, or what was the impact on you, you know, at this point in your life, writing your memoir and then suddenly realizing that you really didn't know any of the story? Yeah, revelatory. Um, the eldest person in my, I have 25 cousins on both sides of the family. The eldest in my generation is now 94, I believe, and I interviewed her, and she told me a story that just blew me away which is um, that my grandfather was approached by one of his sons. My grandfather owned a coffee and tea store on the Lower East Side when they first came over here in the early aughts, 19 aughts. And uh, one of his sons said, I'm the first one married and I'm, my wife is pregnant and why don't you, you're old now. Of course, he was about 60, my grandfather. Um, and you should give me the store. But there were two other sons. And a brouhaha developed over the store. Terrible, terrible family fights about money are the worst. My grandfather had given his word, but the brothers were making a lot of trouble. And so my uncle went on a program called um, the, uh, Ask uh, ask Mr. Alexander, I think was his last name. It was a program that is as popular today as Saturday Night Live. And they used to say, ask Mr. Anthony. And they used to say at the outset, ask Mr. Anthony, he will solve your problems. And it was this familiar to 40 million Americans listening on the radio in the 1940s as, you know, now, you know, live from New York, it's Saturday night. And my uncle writes a letter to the program and uh, proposes that he go on the program and that Mr. Anthony solve his problem, which is his brothers don't want him to have the store and he's the only one who's married and he's having a child. And he does. He goes on the air and my, my cousin who's 94 remembered it, she said, <laughs> and she said, it broke up the family. I had no idea. I never noticed that my other uncle Lou the one who got the store was never at family events, except we went to his bat mitzvah, his bar mitzvah, which is the picture on the cover of this book, is that disowned uncle, because my mother insisted we're Jewish, everyone has to come for a simcha. And everyone came, and nobody spoke to Lou. And you can look at the pictures and the faces on everybody, because there were a lot of sour faces. They had been pushed there by you know, my mother who had the conscience of the family and was holding the family together. I mean, these are transformative for me mm -hmm. to suddenly discover that we were publicly shamed before 40 million listeners on the radio. <laughs> Incredible. Are you, is your sense in writing the book, the sense that my family, you're saying, has so many secrets that nobody else has, or is part of the point of the book that everybody has these kinds of secrets? You're, you're absolutely on point, because whenever I talk about the secrets in my family while I was writing the book, people would say to me, you think that's bad? <laughs> and they would tell me stories that were like my story. I mean, there were people now who, of course, have discovered through DNA and, and gene testing mm -hmm. and, you know, the scrape that you sent to send away to 23andMe, who've discovered that they share lots of siblings because they're the product of a sperm donor. Mm -hmm. um, Danny Shapiro, right. I think. Who, who's here. Who has been here and who's a good friend, um, tells that story. But so many people have made the similar discoveries. I also have heard about people who didn't know they had a sister or a brother even before DNA testing mm -hmm. and so on. Um, you know, my, my nephew who came out in his 30s as, as a gay man, um, he came out to me in the most mysterious and convoluted way, you'll recall. He was living in Seattle. He was always a very good looking, very mechanically adept kid. I mean, it, it was like he was switched at birth because we don't know anybody in our, no <laughs> Jews are mechanically adept. You know, you know a Jewish home because the 12 is flashing on the video machine. <laughs> and he was really gifted. Um, but he always were, was reticent and sort of withholding at Thanksgiving or at, at the Seder. 
and he moved to Seattle, which was a sign. I mean, people don't move that far away in our family. Everybody's in the borough somewhere, more or less. Um, and I get a letter from him, which I'd never received. Uh, he, he's uh, one of my sister's children. I have four nephews and nieces on, from my sister, and from the sister I knew existed, I have two, a nephew and a niece. So he writes to me, I am enclosing a, a clipping about a lesbian mother who lost custody of her children because of her sexuality. And I turn, I turn to my husband, I give him the letter and the clipping, and I said, I think Jeffrey wants me to know he's gay. And my husband, who's a lawyer, said, you're reaching a very de a large conclusion from scant evidence, mm -hmm. you know, he said. And I said, what else does this mean? He said, it means he thinks you're interested in, you know, injustice to lesbian mothers. I said, I've never gotten anything from him. He's telling me he's gay, and he wants to make sure that I pave the way when he comes for Thanksgiving. And I called my sister and brother-in-law, and I said, I think Jeffrey is going to tell you, is, come out, is going to come out when he uh, gets here from Seattle, and I just think you should be prepared. And God bless my sister and brother-in-law. Their first reaction was, what? And their second reaction is, what should we read to prepare? Wow. And then his brother, Jeffrey's brother, in a very close family, was the most shocked, not because he ha he's ha homophobic, in any way, but because he said, we were supposed to be this perfect family. You know, how could he have lived for all that time hiding what he thought was imperfect? He felt such pain for his brother having lived a lie close up. You know, they shared a bedroom or something. Right. That's powerful. Yeah. Um, question also. When you were writing the book again and going through the various experiences, right? So some of the secrets in the book you found out about you know, now, looking back, but there were other revelations that happened along the way. And in this book, you also describe various secrets that you kept and that you never really spoke about or some you've written about here and there, but there were your secrets growing up. And I'm wondering to what extent those always kind of made sense to you as like you're just acting in your family's way while they were happening? Yeah. Or did those things kind of like snap into place more while you were organizing them for the memoir? Well, I put language to it. Uh, years ago, Ms. Magazine, of which I'm a co-founder, um, ran a petition, an open letter, when uh, abortion was illegal before Roe v. Wade, and said, we've had abortions. And we got very, very, very famous women to mm -hmm. sign it. Uh, I signed it. But I never told the whole story until I, I published a piece in the New York Times. And I described my one abortion. I, I did not ever admit that I had two abortions in my senior year because I didn't have a mother. I don't think I understood, you know, fertilization or anything. I just think I was pretty blind to my own body and so on. Um, but when I found out I was pregnant, one of those times, I, I uh, decided I would kill myself because I could not, could not ex explain this to my family. And um, I, I was fortunate enough, I was at Brandeis. It was about six weeks before graduation. And I just, um, I, I had no idea what to do. And luckily my roommate, Selma Shapiro, my roommate who shall always be, I be, always will be in her debt, she deduced that something was really going on with me and took me in her arms and said, You've, I'm not letting you go until you tell me what's happening to you, what's happening. And I, I did admit it. This, mind you, is in 1959. I graduated from college at 19. And to kill myself was the only solution I, I could think of rather than uh, face the ignominy of being pregnant and not un unmarried. You know, the, a bastard, a, a momser, was the worst thing that you could produce. So she took me to our dorm counselor, which somehow she figured out that our dorm counselor was going to kind of be the, connected to the abortion underground, and she was. 
She was a refugee from the Nazis. She was the fencing coach at Brandeis. And she, first of all, reassured me and said, there's absolutely nothing wrong with you. You are not an immoral person. You're a sexual person, and all you need is a, is a diaphragm, which was, I'd never heard of this. I've never, never encountered anybody saying anything like that. Um, and she connected me to Dr. Robert Spencer, a saint, I mean, truly, who performed, uh, some say, 40,000 abortions legally, not legally, but uh, medically safe abortions in a clinic in Ashland, Pennsylvania. Selma Shapiro drove me there. And um, I was able to graduate. And five years later, I married somebody. And we had three wanted children and six wanted grandchildren. Wow. And that really brings the focus out a little bit. Right. Um, what do you think, as somebody who has that kind of experience, especially writing about it before Roe versus Wade, um, what's the connection for you between talking about things that were secret or bringing secrets out into the light and social justice or social progress? Thank you for that question. I talk about it now all the time. I encourage people, women, and their consorts, husbands, boyfriends, to talk about it, it's because even after Roe, which is 50 years in the past, mm -hmm. women and others talk about it with stigma attached. They don't share it except with their closest friends. They think it marks them. Um, the number of people who have abortions every year, and it's hard for me to say people, pregnant people or anything like that, I'm still believing that we need to center women we worked so long to get the spotlight on women, and now we're calling pregnant people. In any case, <clears throat> that's another one of my, my sideline beefs, but um, I feel it's urgent to talk about the things we used to be ashamed of that we share with others. I never told my own sister. I went off to Dr. Spencer with my roommate because I thought my sister was this upright, perfect woman and my sister ends up telling me years later that she had several abortions because she and her husband were living on a teacher's salary and they had four children and they could not have supported another. She told me my mother had two abortions because she was an abused wife before she got her divorce, which was her major Shonda, to be divorced in 1927 in a Jewish context. Shonda worthy. Um, my mother had had two abortions uh, because well, one at the end when her former husband tried to get her back and you know, took her away for a weekend. She got pregnant and she was not going to be able to save the marriage. And my grandmother, who had seven children and some miscarriages, also had abortions. If I had known that, I would not have you know, castigated myself, considered jumping off the Triborough Bridge, which really, or in front of a, a front running E train, which truly were my two plans, really were. Um, but I thought I was the only one. I had no idea that the women in my family had it for different reasons poverty, too many children, shame, a failed marriage, abuse, real reasons had had abortions and then either had had children before or went on to have children they wanted. And we have got to surface this, especially now when the struggle is, uh, has to be reactivated. Mm -hmm. It's a different struggle now. Do you think your book is oversharing in a little sense? No, because at, at 83, I think I have a right to okay. look back. <laughs> I have a right to look back. Uh, and my generation and my parents' generation, their experiences need to be reified. They need to be caught and captured in writing because um, I think it's too easy to forget where we all come from, assuming we're all Ashkenazi Jews and can count immigrants two generations ago mm -hmm. or three generations ago. Not to forget that. Um, when my husband and I were married 35 years, we rented the Lower East Side Tenement Museum. We took all of our, we took our children. We didn't have grandchildren yet. We took our children there. We invited all of the members of the family who were alive then, who came from everywhere. We told them to bring artifacts from their lives to share. 
so that we could remember uh, our ancestors who came here, how brave they were, what they lived in, to look at um, a room, of, an apartment at the uh, Lower East Side uh, Tenement Museum, and to realize that we now live in an apartment with a very high ceiling and beautiful windows off Central Park West. How did we get there? You know, in two generations. It's a miracle of our, of our family's um, stick-to-itiveness and uh, commitment to become real Americans and to make it, make it in, mm -hmm. in this country and, and to claim the American dream. Their hard work is what got me and my husband and our children to where they are. They came off the boat with no education and we had two daughters at Yale. We have granddaughters at Yale. Um, how did that happen? How did, we, how did that happen in this family that started in a shtetl in Hungary, or maybe it was Poland, because it changed mm -hmm. its uh, borders? And I don't think that that um, history and that heritage should be forgotten. So maybe all the secret keeping worked in a certain sense. <laughs> You mean because it was there for me to well, they got, excavate? Well, first of all, that, but also your parents got the result that they wanted. Not happily. Not happily. No. When you look at some of the larger culture wars in America, this is kind of part two of that question, and a lot of them focus on different versions of the past or different versions of how to present history or don't say it happened like this, say it happened like this, right. or who, who are you to say bad things about those people as opposed to those people? Right. Do you think that there's a certain element of shanda or shame <laughs> behind those debates? Yes. Don't, don't teach shame certain and shame, things, shame don't read certain denial. books. Yeah, yeah. I, I think people don't want to admit our racist past. That, mm -hmm. I mean, I know people close to me admit that they grew up hearing Schwarza and they, never realized that, you know, even though it means black in, in Yiddish, that there's a pejorative quotient to mm -hmm. the word. They never realized that their parents said, is the girl coming on Thursday? Or, um, you know, things that are not overtly, horrifically racist, but suggest a kind of um, superior, inferior mm -hmm. relationship. We need to own up to that, the, just as much as we own up to, you know, I wish I hadn't said that to mm -hmm. my kid, because it left a, a little bit of a scar, you know, you, or you wish that you didn't discipline with anger, that you disappeared with, with <clears throat> dialogue and interaction. You have regrets, uh, but you need to acknowledge them. Thank you so much. Thank you.